Hello and welcome to this episode of the Global Innovators in Business series. In this series, we bring leaders and innovators from different fields to share their advice and expertise with undergraduate students to provide inspiration and motivation during the pandemic. We're so happy to have with us Ms. Stephanie von Friedeberg. Stephanie heads all the International Finance Corporation's investment operations and advisory services to create jobs, positive development outcomes, and opportunities in the world's most poverty-stricken and fragile countries. In addition, she manages IFC's $55 billion debt and equity portfolio. Thank you for joining us, Stephanie. Christopher, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. So I would dedicate uh, our interview to something called WeFi, which is a program that was started by a series of, of 30 governments, and it was designed to help women entrepreneurs in emerging markets. And mm -hmm. when I look at the COVID crisis and the disproportionate burden that women um, have suffered as a result of the crisis, I think we have a lot to do there. And so I'd like to dedicate the interview to WeFi and to the women we're trying to help. So to start off with you, was there a story or a moment that inspired you to be a part of international development or to put your career into this field? Christopher, when I was 16, um, I was an American field service student and I went and lived um, on a very small pig farm south of Imatra in Finland. And um, I was one of the very first people in my family, my immediate family to have a passport because I grew up in, in rural Montana in the United States. Um, and I took a bus trip into the Soviet Union and I was the only American on the bus. Um, and a Russian soldier came on the bus and in English asked for the American passport. And I was just hooked. I came back and I said to my parents, well, I know you want me to be a doctor but I'm going to study international relations. And ultimately that path um, through the IBD program at Georgetown and through some work I did on Wall Street kind of after undergrad led me to really understand that if you want to um, work in development, putting, putting business and economics together with development really is, was then and continues to be the future of how we, um, how we create a better world. And a lot of us in the audience are young professionals and students of this age. So we're trying to think of ways to potentially join this like impact driven, development driven field. But when you started your career, how did you look about the problem? So I'm not sure I was as deliberate um, as you all probably are and should be. Uh, but when I graduated from undergrad, um, you could work for the CIA, you could work for, you know, the NSA, maybe work for the FBI. I didn't want to be a spy. Um, and so I took my economics background and, and went to Wall Street for three years and worked in a leveraged buyout group. And again, um, learned a whole new set of skills. And then when I got ready to go back to graduate school and was looking for my MBA, Russia was beginning to open back up and, and you went to Penn, so you know what the Lauder Institute is. And so when I applied to Wharton, they were creating a Russian program and they said, we'll help pay for your MBA if you'll come to Lauder and get a master's um, in the Russian Area Studies program. So I figured that was a pretty good thing to do. And, and then when I graduated from grad school, I thought, okay, well, I'll go work in investment banking in Eastern Europe. And quite frankly, there were no jobs um, in Eastern Europe in investment banking at the time. It was 1992. There were some big consulting companies. So the BCGs and the Baines and the McKinsey's of the world were beginning to work in that part of the world. Um, and then a friend of mine actually went to the IFC presentation on campus and came back and said, I think I found the place you ought to work. <laughs> and so I put my, my CV in and, you know, 29 and a half years later, I'm still at IFC. Could you paint us a picture of some of the highlights and some of the, 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 the rosiest moments of this career and some of the most challenging, most difficult parts of this career. So I would say that those might be the same thing. Um, when, and when you kind of look back, when I look back over the history of my career, the things that I'm proudest of were probably the things that were most challenging. But you know, the beauty of being in the World Bank Group is that they, um, they hire really smart, really talented people, and then they take risks on you. Um, and I think unlike the private sector, they give you opportunities that you otherwise wouldn't necessarily get. So straight out of grad school, 
I joined the YP program and I was um, on a rotation in South Asia in India. And then my very first mission was sent to Bihar, which is the communist part of kind of north of Calcutta and um, got stuck um, because there were riots and came back to Washington and thought, oh, I'm not really sure this job is for me. And three weeks later, I was on a plane um, moving to Moscow and I lived in Russia for five years um, for IFC and we did all of the privatization. So large scale privatization, small scale privatization, land privatization, Boris Nemtsov was a friend. Um, you know, we, it was just an incredible experience. And Christopher, when I, when I left that job, I thought this is probably the pinnacle of my career. Never again am I gonna have an opportunity to really see, you know, history change because that's what we were doing. Um, and from that job, I actually was um, reassigned to a, the telecom and technology team to run that. And, you know, there were 300 million cell phones in the world and our executive director said, why are we giving luxury items to rich, to, to poor people? They don't need cell phones. And we pushed that development curve to a point where when I left, there were, I don't know, I want to say 4 billion cell phones in the world. And, you know, anywhere in Africa, people had access. They didn't have to get on a bus uh, for three days to make a, a physical payment for a child's education because they could do it with a, with a digital phone. And we invested in a lot of technologies over that curve. And I look at that process and again, I say, wow, we really made a difference for the world. Um, and, I, you know, my whole career in IFC and, and at the bank group kind of writ large is, is kind of, you know, punctuated by these really interesting opportunities and jobs where we were able to change the world and the future of development. And um, it's an incredibly rewarding thing to do. And believe me, it's not easy. I mean, you're talking about pushing governments on policy and regulation. You're talking about convincing your board of directors and your management to do things that they've never done before. And they're not quite sure we should do it. Um, and, you know, those can be discouraging, but they're also really uplifting and, and you learn and grow as you do them. What are some innovations and technologies that you think in the next decade or the decade after will be most influential, especially for the developing world? So I look at the COVID crisis and I, I've all, so I've always been a big believer in digital and having spent as much time investing in it as I have, and then actually being the World Bank Group CIO for a while and spending time in Silicon Valley, I have always thought that um, we needed to look at technology as a way to solve really difficult development challenges. So, you know, in, investors in Silicon Valley and, and startups in Silicon Valley sit in there and ask themselves, how can I disrupt this sector, right? How can I disrupt the transport sector? How can I disrupt the hotel sector? And you get Uber and you get Airbnb. We need to ask those same questions about how do I solve really difficult development challenges? The answers are there. Um, and I think they revolve around helping all of our countries of operation create digital economies. I think um, uh, retail platforms, Alibaba, Amazons of the world are gonna be super important for these countries as they move forward. But if you just look at Africa, 60% of the GDP outside of South Africa is generated by SMEs. To give them access to digital platforms to sell their goods, informally and then formally will help grow those economies in really interesting ways. And to the extent that, you know, we can add to that connectivity to global supply chain. So I might be able to buy something, you know, from an artistic entrepreneur in the Democratic Republic of Congo and have it delivered to me. That is really interesting. And I, I think um, digital literacy will have to drive that. Digital payment systems and what underpins that will be super important. Um, I think blockchain will play a role in terms of um, thinking about development of global supply chains and how we can have traceability to how we're selling things globally. Um, and then there's material sciences. So we recently invested in a company called Appeal, which is one of my favorite investments. And it's a vegetable coating that um, surrounds fruits and vegetables and extends their uh, shelf life by as much as uh, four weeks without refrigeration. So we can go and work with an avocado manufacturer in Madagascar and help them sort their product, code it in a way that we know that this is first, you know, this is grade A, it can be shipped to Europe for sale. Mm -hmm. This one we can, you know, sell domestically and it, it helps pre preserve food, it reduces waste. 
So material sciences, I think we're going to see a lot of advancements in terms of building materials and how we embed solar and solar-like things into building materials. Uh, and then there's medicine, right? And things like mRNA technology and other technologies that will allow us to provide more resilient and better medical care in emerging markets is going to be critical. Well, and then Christopher, imagine what you can bet on and embed on top of that. I mean, what we're learning is now embedded finance is a really important piece. So if you are, you know, a platform owner and you see um, what a retailer is selling, you know, how much they, how much they turn, you know, how quickly their inventory turns, how much financing they might need. And if you look at an Alibaba, which was capable then of using that data and all the compute power to actually then begin lend money through Ant Finance to these small entrepreneurs, mm-hmm. it's got huge legs. And then you don't need, you know, a bank branch on every corner. You, it's expensive to lend money to SMEs and using um, data and AI to do that more cheaply and more accurately, I think is super fascinating. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I've lived in Beijing uh, for half my life and I've lived in the United States for half my, half my life. And throughout this entire time, I think like the intersection between these different countries and working together and building relationships and building trade is so important. Like how do you think we can continue to encourage or, or create more ties, more bridges between developed countries and developing countries or within developing countries as well? Yeah. So I think we've learned a lot from COVID. To me, there's two forces at play in terms of global trade, one of um, which is a nationalization and a pulling back from the globalization that has really allowed us to pull so many hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. That gives me pause. But what I think is underneath it um, is a far more integrated uh, global economy that can't be disconnected quite as quickly or as fast as we think it can. And COVID clearly showed us that. I mean, you've seen the disruption of supply chains, the, you know, the lack of cargo ships and, and containers in the right places, the lack of toilet paper, the fact that, you know, things are substantially more expensive and you can't find them because somebody's supply chain has been broken. Those kinds of things are teaching us that we need to rethink some of our supply chain. And I think you'll see more nearshoring and onshoring than we've seen in the past. And I think a lot of that, back to our first question, will be driven by technology as well. So you know, people created global supply chains primarily driven by um, the cost of labor, right? And driving down the cost of labor for cheap, for cheaper output. But as technology takes over and as robotics gets stronger, it's not clear to me that you're necessarily going to be looking at the cost of labor in the same way we have historically. And I think you'll see more and more fully automated um, machine lines and, you know, it'll be a man and his dog sort of guarding the robots as opposed to you know, massive um, factories of, 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 uh, of workers, which creates its own set of obstacles and, you know, for thinking about development, because we need to make sure that everyone has access to a job and everyone has access to generating a way for, you know, to create prosperity for themselves and their families. And, you know, growing people's digital skills will be critical. And it, you know, oftentimes when people think about development, they don't think about human capital development. And yet, you know, if you look at the 450 million children who are out of school right now because of COVID and the vast numbers of those that won't go back, if you can't read and write, you can't function in a digital economy. And so there's, again, one of these really big dichotomies that I think COVID is driven that we're going to have to address. What is your advice for young professional students amidst this pandemic? What, what do you recommend them to work on, to improve on? If you were in our shoes, what would you be learning? What would you be doing? So I cannot imagine being in your shoes right now. Um, You know, I think about, I have children about your age and, you know, I'm watching them come out of college and then, and, and graduate school and try to figure out, okay, how do I build a career virtually? How do I find the job that really excites me? I think, um, Christopher, and I've learned this in my own career, patience is super important. Life is not linear. And if COVID has showed us anything, it's that life isn't linear. Um, So I think that uh, all of the students today need to be open and curious Mm -hmm. uh, and learn through this process about themselves, um, about what their desires are. Because at the end of the day, if your North Star is aligning your interests and your desires, you will have a really successful career and a really successful life. 
And when I look at, at my friends who have been more successful and less successful that, that were in graduate school with me, for example, the ones that got that alignment right um, ended up having really interesting careers and, and balancing their work life in a way that was meaningful to them. Looking back on my career and saying, wow, we really made a difference. And again, you know, I can pin those places. I, I, well, I'll give you an example. Um, at the tail end of the work that I was doing in telecom, um, we were a, a unique hybrid group that was a World Bank group unit. So we had the policy and regulation folks, we had the people that were lending to governments, and then we had my team that was doing the private sector piece. Mm -hmm. And the public sector team came and we were all sitting around having lunch together one day and they said, you know, they want to build a new um, undersea cable up the east coast of Africa and the incumbent telecom operators want to own it. Mm -hmm. And I said, why would we do that? Let's look at competition policy and let's figure out whether or not we can make this a private sector cable and what would it take to make it a private sector cable? That was a five-year journey. And um, the first investment that we made was in a company called Wyoc. And we called it the easy cable. Why we called it the easy cable, I don't know, because it wasn't easy. We took an equity investment and lent money. And then the incumbent telecom operators and other people interested in access to the cable um, came mm -hmm. into that investment. And there's now four equivalent cables laid up the eastern side of Africa. There's very limited connectivity up the west side of Africa because it's still controlled by the dominant, you know, incumbent operators. And if you look at the differential between technology investment and access in Kenya and Senegal and the cost of that, it's fundamental. And, you know, there's incubators in Kenya and there's young entrepreneurs that are creating all sorts of interesting little companies that are solving development challenges. Super exciting. And, you know, when, when I look at Africa and I look at just the impact of that work, it's, it's rewarding in a way that I'm not sure had I stayed on Wall Street, I would have felt as, as satisfied and, and fulfilled. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing. One last question I had is, I know we, uh, just on a broader picture, we understand the world after COVID from the developing world perspective. Most of us live in the US and in the audience. Um, we see that things are, are open, that there are still some restrictions, but it's gradually opening up. Um, but we really don't know what is happening inside the developing world. How is it different for the lifestyle of COVID, especially without a lot of the vaccine distribution into the developing world, especially the economies are potentially more reliant on factors of production that needs uh, that, that, that are hindered by COVID-19. Well, paint us a picture of what is happening in the, in the developing world and how can we potentially be a part of helping to solve or helping in this problem? So Christopher, I, I think that um, COVID-19 did one thing. We knew there were inequalities in the world, but it laid bare the magnitude of those inequalities. And when I look just at vaccine distribution, so we're not gonna prevent the spread of COVID-19 until the world is vaccinated. And we're going to keep seeing, you know, um, variants arise and they're going to come from emerging markets and the global world is too interconnected to prevent the spread of that. Mm -hmm. And yet um, we all went back to our national borders and we said, shut them down. And so the places where vaccines were made, um, we're not allowing those vaccines to be sold into emerging markets. So today, I think 1.4, 1.5% of the people on the African continent have been vaccinated. And, you know, I compare and contrast that to the medical situation. So in the Central African Republic, there are three ventilators, three. In the United States, there's 275,000 ventilators. In Nigeria, which is a country of a population two-thirds the size of the United States, um, you know, there's a couple hundred ventilators. So, you know, if you get COVID, the probability you are going to live if you need a ventilator in an emerging market is extremely low. Um, and so, one, I'm not sure that we're, we're properly actually diagnosing all the cases, but two, it's made it very difficult for those economies. And I think even worse, um, what we're seeing is a decoupling of the economies. So, uh, you know, the developed world is coming back. The, you know, signs are that economic growth is, is, is um, resuming. China looks better. Europe looks better. The U.S. looks better. Emerging markets are decoupling and moving in the wrong direction. Go back to 2008, 2009, kind of post-financial crisis. 
It took us about four years to get to a point where emerging markets were back where they were pre-crisis and investment Mm -hmm. flows were coming back at the same pace. I think it's 10 years if we're not careful coming out of the COVID crisis. So, you know, what does that mean for, um, you know, the majority of the world where quite frankly, you know, uh, true private sector led growth has to come from emerging markets in the next decade. You know, the, urbanization and, you know, the growth of the middle class, it all needs to happen in emerging markets because that's where the people are and that's where consumer-led growth, I think, will happen. Um, But how do we actually kickstart that is what we really need to focus on. And then if you layer, I think, over the top of that, kind of the the, the twin crisis of climate and ask ourselves, okay, you know, Africa produces 4% of the the GHG emissions in the world. And, you know, there's 1.3 1.3 billion people who don't have access to electricity, 800 million of which are on the African continent. How do we solve that problem? And how do we give, you know, energy for people access to energy cleanly? These are all challenges that I have seen in the World Bank Group and quite frankly, the kind of MDB and development community writ large are going to have to solve in the next five or 10 years. And, you know, people, students and, and young people who are interested in development, this is going to be another one of those pinnacle times in, I think, in in global development history where the job that you will do and you'll look back and say, wow, I made a difference. 